All right, today we're going to talk about how we can set up neural networks that can process images. These are called convolutional neural networks. So uh, in the beginning of this class, uh, one motivating example I used, uh, it's motivating because it's you know, quite appealing, is if you have this cute puppy and you want to classify whether it's a picture of a puppy or a cat or a hippopotamus or a giraffe, you could perhaps train a neural network uh, to solve this task. In principle, this should work really well, but if we try to apply the kinds of neural networks that we developed in the previous lecture to this, it's going to be pretty tough. So let's talk about this, the first linear layer in such a network. This is a linear layer that reads in an image and produces the first vector of activations. The number of weights in this linear layer is going to be equal to the number of activations in the first hidden layer, Z1, times the number of numerical values in the entire image. So for every pixel in the image and for every color channel, we have to have a number of weights equal to the number of outputs, the number of elements in Z1. Um, so that means that if our image is, let's say, 128 by 128 by 3, that's not a very large image, so it's 128 pixels by 128 pixels by three color channels, red, green, and blue, uh, which is 49,152 4, numbers. And our first hidden layer has 64 dimensions, which is actually a pretty small hidden layer. Like You're essentially asking the, the model to summarize everything about the image into 64 numbers, which is tiny. Even then, the total number of parameters in this first weight vector will be 64 times 49,152, which is over 3 million. And that's just in the very first layer for this tiny 64 dimensional hidden layer. In practice, you probably want a lot more than 64, so this layer is going to be enormous. We really need a better way to process images. In fact, there, there are bigger problems with this than just the, the raw number of parameters. There's also the problem that if this photograph of a puppy is shifted to the left or to the right by even a single pixel, it'll look totally different to the network. So we really want to do something better. So here's an idea. A lot of visual features that we care about are in some sense local. So if we want to kind of use our intuition to think about how we would recognize that this is a picture of a puppy, maybe first we would extract edges, and then maybe we would extract some local regions like ears and noses. Okay, these are human ears and noses, but puppy ears and noses, I imagine, are, you know, work on a similar principle. The interesting thing about these properties is that they're all local features. So in, to determine if there's an edge in a particular location, you only need to look at nearby pixels. To determine if there's a nose, you also need to only look at nearby pixels. Now, noses are bigger than edges, so to, to find a nose, maybe you need to look at a larger region of pixels, but they're still local. And we actually know, uh, in, uh, you know from, from neuroscience experiments that uh, in the mammalian brain, in monkeys and cats and humans, visual processing is local like this, that there are feature detectors for local uh, spatially coherent features. Of course, not all visual detection is local. There are, there are some global aspects. Uh, like, for example, if you want to figure out uh, if, uh, you know, who's going to win in a, in a uh, football match, maybe you need to look at where the ball is and where the other players are and they're far apart and all that. But low-level visual processing tends to be pretty local. So we can use this observation to design a type of neural network that can get away with having many fewer parameters by first doing local operations and then only performing global operations when the amount of information has been reduced to a much more manageable level. So the idea here is to tell if a particular patch of image contains a feature, it's enough to only look at the local patch, and that's what we're going to try to do. So many useful image features are local. Let's try to build a network that looks at only a region of pixels at a time and doesn't have to connect up every point in the output with every single pixel in the input. And maybe that, that little network can look at every patch of image. So if it's like a little detector for edges, maybe it can look at this patch and this patch and this patch and this patch, and it can actually be the same network for every patch because the way that you recognize an edge in an image doesn't change depending on where you're looking, right? So uh, the presence of a horizontal edge can be computed by the same function looking at this patch of image as it can for this patch of image. So let's say the patch is like three by three and it has three color channels. That means it has 27 numbers. And let's say we're going to be computing 64 features for that patch, so just like before we had 64. Now, 64 times 27 is only 1,728. 
So we went from over 3 million parameters to uh, less than 2,000. That's really nice. However, now we get a different output for each image location. So we have this little network, this little 3x3 three three patch network, but it will produce a different output for every location. So here's how that's going to work. Let's say that this cube represents our image. So it has a height of 128, a width of 128, and a depth, meaning the number of color channels, of 3. We're going to take our little 3x3 three three, uh, network, and we're going to apply it to every patch, every 3x3 three three patch in that image. Uh, so our, our little linear layer has a height of 3, a width of 3, and a depth uh, of 3. And that produces one feature. So this is our mini layer. It's also called a filter. Now we have 64 outputs, so we need one of these little boxes, one of these little 3x3x3 three by three by three things for every output of which there are 64. So we need a bunch of these things. Okay, here I drew four of them. And that produces a little vector of length 4 for every position in that input image. So this is a depth of 4, and we're going to slide it over every position in the image and compute a different depth 4 vector for every 3x3 three three patch. And remember, these patches overlap, so it's not like we just like grid up the image into size 3 chunks, we actually slide it over by one pixel each time. So every 3x3 three three patch sliding over every, every single pixel. So the, the number of outputs we produce, uh, you have these four dimensional vectors in this case, uh, 64, we had 64 features, four in this picture here, and the dimensionality is going to be roughly 128 by 128. Uh, and after that, you apply nonlinearity to each of them, just like you did in the regular neural network. Okay, so now we've we've, uh, s s we've kind of passed this little three by three filter over every three by three patch on the image, and we get another box which has a depth of four and a width and height of also one twenty eight. There's something kind of funny that happens at the corners and at the edges of the image, and we'll talk about that later. So for now, let's just say that it's that it remains 128 by 128. But if you're wondering right now what happens when you apply this little filter at a corner or at an edge, don't worry, we'll get back to that later. Okay, so now we've kind of turned our image, our 128 by 128 by 3 image, into a 128 by 128 by 4, or 64 if you had 64 features, I just couldn't draw 64 boxes, uh, map of activations. Right, so it's, it's almost like an image, only now Every pixel is not really a pixel anymore. It's actually a little vector of features. Um, what do they look like? Well, here are some examples of filters. So these are the little boxes. And you can imagine passing each of those filters over the image. And for the corresponding filter, the activation will be the degree to which that feature is present. So if the feature is a horizontal edge, you'll get bright colors in places that have horizontal edges and dark ones where they don't. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here. We haven't actually made things any smaller. So we've reduced the number of parameters we have, but our activations are still these giant maps that have the same resolution as the original image and potentially more depth because we might want more features than there were color channels in the original image. So what we can do is we can now reduce the size of this thing. We're going to take every two by two patch it can be any other number, but let's say 2 by 2 for now. And that patch has a depth of 4. And what we'll do is we'll turn into a 1 by 1 by 4 patch. And the way we'll do that is that in each 2 by 2 region for every channel, we'll take the maximum activation. So we'll take a max for each channel over that region. And we'll do that for every region. And now the regions will actually be non-overlapping. So here we really will grid the image uh, into these uh, two by two chunks so that these are not overlapping patches. This is essentially downsampling. It's taking this image of activations and downsampling it into a smaller uh, activation map. So here's a little picture of what this looks like in this case for a 224 by 224 by 64 map. Um, so the little uh, black and white image shows the response for one of the filters, basically one of the uh, features in this 224 by 224 map. And when we do max pooling, we basically take the brightest pixel in each 2x2 uh, two two region. Why do we do max? Well, intuitively, if the activations in this map represent the degree to which that feature is present, it makes sense that we would ask, well, let's just evaluate the presence of that feature in that region 
by taking the maximum activation. So if you want to know if there is a horizontal edge in the top left of the image, you just look at a few of the activations in the top left and see if any of them have a horizontal edge. And that's what the max pooling does. It basically, set, it'll basically uh, calculate whether the feature is present at all in that patch and then uh, write the corresponding number into the resulting position. So that's why we often use max pooling. Uh, and after this uh, max pooling operation, we get another map that is smaller. So the, the blue color here denotes the convolution operation, which is passing this filter over every position in the image. The yellow color denotes the pooling operation. After pooling, the depth remains exactly the same because we pool every feature independently, but the height and width is now smaller by a factor equal to the size of the pooling region. So here the pooling region was 2, so we went from 128 to 64. If the pooling region was 4, we would have gone from 128 to 32. So this is called max pooling. So now we've described how we can do a convolution and then max pooling. And don't forget, after the convolution, you have to apply a nonlinearity. This is not present in the picture here, but always after the convolution, you have a nonlinearity like a ReLU. It's just not drawn in this picture, but remember that it's there. Uh, and then after the pooling, you can perform another convolution. So maybe we have uh, eight uh, features that we want to calculate. So we have uh, a little 3 by 3 by 8 filter. We pass it over every position in that pooled uh, activation map, and we get another 64 by 64, and now by 8 thing. And then maybe we do another round of pooling. Uh, there's a type of there that should be 2 by 2 by 8, and that gives us a 32 by 32 by 8 pooled activation map. Okay, so that's basically the architecture of a convolutional neural network. Convolution, followed by nonlinearity, pooling, another convolution, another nonlinearity, another pooling. And the size of the filters can change, so they don't have to be 3 by 3, they could be 3, they, they could be like 5 by 5 or 7 by 7. It's often very convenient to use an odd number though. And the size of the pooling can change, it could be 2 by 2, it could be 4 by 4. And the number of filters can change. So let's look at, a, at an example of an actual uh, convolutional uh, neural network. This is the Lynette network that was used for handwritten uh, digit recognition. It uh, takes 32 by 32 handwritten characters as input. Then it has the first uh, convolutional uh, layer, and that convolutional layer has six channels, six features. So it has six features, and the size of the map is 28 by 28. Why is it smaller than 32 by 32? Well, it actually has to do with those edges, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then there's this thing that's labeled a subsampling, which is just a synonym for pooling, and that's a, a 2 by 2 pooling, so that turns these 28 by 28 maps into 14 by 14 maps, labeled S2 here. Then there's another round of convolutions, and that next round of convolutions has 16 features, uh, and that gets us a C3, which is a feature map with 16, uh, depth 16, and um, the maps are 10 by 10. Again, they're smaller than 14 by 14 because of those edge effects, which we'll discuss later. Then there's another round of pooling. The 10 by 10 goes into a 5 by 5. So now you have 16 features in a 5 by 5 region. So that's 25 times 16 activations. And that's actually small enough that now you can flatten them into a big vector and put them into a standard fully connected linear layer, just like we learned about last time. So, and remember that each of those convolutions, they have a, a nonlinearity and activation function after them. Again, this is often not drawn in these pictures, but if someone just writes convolution and there's no nonlinearity, uh, there actually is, they just didn't draw it in the picture. So after every convolution, there would be a nonlinearity like a sigmoid or a ReLU. Always, always, always. Uh, it's, it's virtually unheard of to have convolutions that are not followed by nonlinearities. Okay, so that's an example of an actual convolutional neural network.